Okay, so let's get started then. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the very lovely Tom White. Tom is going to be talking about single cell big data. There's a clue up there. Are you all in the right room? Yeah, sweet. Okay. Um, Tom was one of the first Apache Hadoop committers and wrote a book about it too. Um, he hails from the very beautiful Brecon Beacons. We've been having lovely conversations about the Brecon Beacons and Crick Howell in particular, which is one of my favorite parts of the world. I'm Welsh, believe it or not. Anyway, this is about Tom, not me. Uh, more recently, uh, Tom has been using big data tools to analyze large bioinformatic data sets. Um, we ask our speakers to fill in a little interview about themselves, and I really liked Tom's answer to this question. Uh, we asked him to give a very oversimplified idiot's guide to what his talk is going to be in just a couple of sentences. This, this really resonated with me. His explanation is humans produce a lot of data from their cells, and we can make pretty pictures from it. Brilliant. So more seriously, uh, I think Tom is going to talk to us a little bit more than making pretty pictures. Tom is going to look at the Python-based software stack that he uses to manage this data explosion. We have music on. Yeah, OK. Um, and how it can be used in other data-intensive domains. So without further ado, let's give Tom a big traditional round of applause. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to this talk. I'm Tom White. I'm going to be talking about um, single cell technology and big data. Um, so why, why am I going to talk about this? Um, well, I've been working uh, with, oh, sorry, <laughs> why is that not working? The slides are not advancing. Right, so, so I've, been <laughs> I've been working with um, the Laserton Lab in Mount Sinai, New York for the last couple of years uh, on single cell um, data. So we've got Uri Laserton who runs the lab and Brian Williams who um, works in the lab as well. And we've been working on, on this, this subject. And I think it's a, a very interesting subject in its own right. But there are also some interesting tools that we've been using um, that are kind of more broadly applicable. And there are also some pretty cool visualizations um, that uh, we, we, we've been making, which also might be quite applicable to other domains. Um, as Hannah said, I, I spent a lot of time working on Hadoop. Um, I'm uh, I, I was working at Cloudera for, for 10 years, and I wrote uh, the O'Reilly book on, on Hadoop. But I'm not going to talk about Hadoop today. I'm going to talk about big data and cells in, in general. Um, so this isn't the Hadoop talk. <laughs> um, and in fact, I could have called this talk Cells, Data, Algorithms, and Compute. Th these are the four areas that I'm going to talk about um, today. I'm going to start by giving a very kind of basic introduction to cells. Um, by the way, I'm not a biologist, so I hope there aren't any experts in the room. Uh, I'm going to talk in very simple terms about some of the things in cells and how they work a little bit, because that relates to the kind of data that we can collect from cells. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the algorithms that we can run on the data that we've got from the cells. Um, and they're pretty general purpose algorithms, so I'll talk about those and how they, um, how they kind of operate. And then finally, I'll talk about the compute technologies that we use to, um, to run those algorithms. So it's kind of going from very kind of uh, real biology to the, the, um, the compute end of things. Uh, and in particular, things like GPUs and CPUs and the compute side of things. OK, so I'm going to start with cells. Um, there are 37 trillion cells in your body, um, which is a, a huge number, obviously. And each cell itself has an almost unimaginable amount of complexity in the cell. And if I was to oversimplify the last 100 years of um, molecular biology, basically it's been increasing our knowledge of what's actually happening in a cell. Um, here's a diagram of an animal cell, which I'm not going to go through. Um, but you can see already that there are lots of different parts to the cell. But even this is an oversimplification. Um, you can kind of zoom in further and see more and more things. And indeed, that's what um, cell biologists have been, been working on for a long time. This is um, the kind of standard textbook for cell biology. Um, 
I should have taken a sideways picture because it's a really thick book. It's about 1,300 pages long, um, a lot of complexity in there, obviously. And I'm not going to talk about any of that. Um, the point I want to make, really, is that um, our understanding of the cell is very detailed, but it's really understood in aggregate. Um, I said earlier that we've got 37 trillion cells in our body, but we don't really know the different types of cell in our body particularly well. We know, obviously, um, a lung cell is different to a skin cell, but there are much, many more graduations of types of cell which we're only now beginning to learn about. So um, cell understanding cells has been done in aggregate in the sense that we've taken tissue samples and then looked at how those cells work on average. So we've done a lot of averaging in the past. But that has actually changed um, just in the last decade or so. And there's a new technique which is, goes under the kind of very general um, term of single cell sequencing, where it's become possible to isolate a single cell and measure things about that particular cell. Um, and once you can do that, then you can learn things about different cells without doing this kind of averaging across a bunch of cells that you've kind of collected. So this animation here, well, it's a little film, obviously, is um, showing individual cells being barcoded. So you can see, um, you can see that little black blob, that's a barcode, and these, these bigger um, disks are, are individual cells. And the idea is that an individual barcode is put into a, an individual cell. And the barcode is actually a small piece of DNA, which has like a unique, uh, you can think of it as a, uh, a UUID, I guess, um, <laughs> which you introduce into the cell. And then all of the kind of processing later on allows us to um, use that ID to differentiate one cell from another cell. So it's, yeah, it's like a, a UUID in, in, in programming, but being done in the physical world, which is pretty cool. Um, this diagram kind of shows how complex single cell technology is. Um, it's, it's a broad term, but it's, it's been around for 10 years um, or so. If you look at the, on the left over there, you can see that in 2009, um, the first single cell study was, was performed, um, and that literally had one cell. So the researcher managed to isolate a cell, um, but there was only one in, in that experiment. Over the years, obviously, as technology does, things have got a lot better, and um, researchers can now um, study millions of cells in a particular batch, in a particular experiment. So what that means is we have a million cells, and for each of those cells, we have introduced one of those little um, barcodes, so we can look at a million cells in isolation in that data set. Um, and, that's, uh, and, and this shows all of the different names of the technologies. You can see DropSeq there, which I just showed you on the previous slide, was in 2015. So it's, it's not the latest technology, but there are many more, and this has th presumably there are even more in the last couple of years. So this technology has allowed a new, um, has kind of spurred a new project to, to um, come together, which is called the Human Cell Atlas. Um, and the technological advances have allowed um, this new project to be um, launched. It was launched in 2016. And the idea behind it is it's an international collaboration to map all of the cells in the human body. Now, what that doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean every cell, every cell in the 37 trillion cells is going to be um, <coughs> measured and sequenced. It's more about identifying the different types of cell. So I, I mentioned that there are subtypes that we we don't really know about yet. So that's the aim of uh, one of the goals of, of the Human Cell Atlas project. And you've probably heard of the Human Genome Project, which was a project that um, completed its first draft almost 20 years ago, actually at the beginning of the century. Um, and that was a very bold, ambitious um, international effort to sequence and map the human genome. And I think that's a pretty well-known project. It had a lot of um, publicity. Um, and in some ways, I would say the Human Cell Atlas has a similar goal. It's quite an ambitious project. And again, it's an international collaboration with lots of different labs around the world working on it. Um, I think it's quite interesting to look at the wording. These, these statements come from the, uh, the projects themselves. That's how they define their mission. 
So the Human Genome Project was to sequence and map the human genome. It uses the word map, notice. The Human Cell Atlas, I mean, even in the name, it's about maps, <laughs> um, is to create a comprehensive reference maps, not just one map, more ambitious, of all human cells. Um, and I think it's a good term because it's quite an intuitive thing. Everyone has a good idea of what a map is. Um, and it makes it easy to kind of explain what the project is about to people. Um, but I think it's also worth pointing out that when you make a map, you're, you're simplifying reality. Um, you can only cover certain things. You can only measure certain things. It's not uh, a perfect replica of reality. And in the case of the Human Genome Project, it was about measuring or, or sequencing base pairs in the human genome. There was lots of detail in the cell uh, or, or even in... Um, in DNA that was, that was being skipped over and ignored, which is fine, but it's, it's kind of important to understand that um, these are not, um, yeah, these are not highly, they, they have to take a stand and ignore certain things in reality. Um, and that has a parallel in, in geographical maps, of course. This is a, is it called the Mapa Mundi, which is um, a very old map from um, 1300. Um, and you can see it in Hereford Cathedral today. You can go and visit it and, and have a look at it. And this is a map of the world, um, which is very impressive for the time, but obviously things have moved on. Um, we have OpenStreetMap now, which, again, is uh, the goal of OpenStreetMap is to map the whole world. Um, this has a lot more detail, but it's still missing things out, of course. And I think, so my analogy here is that, obviously, um, Human Cell Atlas is... is is um, trying to kind of increase the resolution of, um, of our map of cells in the body. Um, but it's still going to miss some things out. Um, but the idea is that it will allow us to look at um, the world in a new way, in ways that we don't really know how people are going to use in the future, and hopefully make connections so that people can discover new things. Um, this slide shows a recent status report for the Human Cell Atlas. Um, and you can s maybe see, for example, down here, it, we've got um, lung cells. Um, it shows that um, samples have been taken from 160 individuals, and we have over a million cells. And this is data that's stored in the Human Cell Atlas um, repository, which is an open repository. Um, and it's, it's stored in the cloud, and you can, you know, if you're a researcher, you can go and um, interact with that data and do, do experiments or do, do studies on that data. Um, the point is that this, this is growing all the time. Um, it was launched in 2016, and already it's got um, a lot of data in it. And, yeah, one of the goals of Human Cell Atlas is to give us insights that will help us treat disease. Fundamentally, we want to... Um, improve people's lives by using this, this information. And this is just one example that I came across. Um, it's from a paper um, that was published last month. Um, scientists in the University of Edinburgh um, identified a new subtype of liver cell. And they used techniques like I'm going to describe in a minute um, to help, this, help find this new um, type. And it says here, experts hope that by understanding more about how these cells behave, New treatments can be developed more quickly for liver diseases. So um, they're saying exactly what um, the intent of this research is, is, is to improve um, treatment. Okay, so that's my very quick introduction to cells. Um, next, I want to talk about the, the data that we gather from um, human cells. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to have to briefly dip into a little bit of um, uh, biology, which I'll try and explain as best I can. Um, this is called the central dogma. Um, Francis Crick, who you've probably heard of, um, one of the discoverers of the structure of DNA, um, he, he came up with this uh, kind of information flow idea, and he called it the central dogma. And apparently later on, he admitted that he didn't know what the word dogma meant. He just thought it sounded fancy. And um, <laughs> So really, it's like the se yeah the central idea, um, and the central idea is that DNA in cells makes RNA, which makes proteins. So at the top we have DNA, which is a very long molecule, and that makes RNA, and it's labelled here mRNA because it's a messenger RNA, and 
a piece of RNA is a lot shorter and it basically encodes a gene. And then that will be translated into what's labeled here as a polypeptide, which is basically a protein, which is um, something that's useful in your body, um, like hair or skin or other things like that. And what we want to do is measure the different proteins in a particular cell because <coughs> the proteins are the kind of building blocks and we want to know what a particular cell is doing. Is it building this thing or is it building that thing? Um, but actually measuring proteins themselves is difficult because they're, all, they're quite different, whereas RNA is much more uniform. It's basically base pairs, and we have all this amazing sequencing technology to, to sequence that stuff. So instead of measuring the, the proteins, we can measure the RNA, and that gives us a proxy for what proteins are being produced in a particular cell at a particular time. And that is called um, gene expression. The idea is that in any particular cell, some genes are turned on and some genes are turned off. They're not doing anything. Um, and that differs by cell type, but it differs over time as well. Um, there are, you might need to produce extra protein at a particular time, and, and so it, it's time varying. It's a very complicated system. And this picture shows, in a quite intuitive way, what gene expression is. Um, it's a tortoiseshell cat which has different pigments on its skin, and that's because um, there are different levels of expression in pigmentation genes. So the, the, the black area has a different level of expression um, to the white area or the orange area. And that just happened to be, uh, when, when, when those colors were produced, it was just whatever happened to be happening in those cells, um, those skin cells at the time. <coughs> okay, let's dive into a little, we're getting closer to the technology a bit now. Um, how do we represent all of that information in um, computer terms? Um, well, we have a data structure which we call a gene expression matrix. And this is um, a 2D matrix. And across the top, we have genes. Um, down the side, we have cells. Um, and the numbers in the, in, the, in the matrix represent the level of RNA. So at the top corner, so gene zero, cell zero, there's a zero, which shows that no RNA was being produced for that gene, for gene zero, uh, when that cell was, was measured. On the other hand, gene one in that cell has a level of 25, which basically is a count of the number of pieces of RNA that it, 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 it measured when, um, when it was being sequenced. Um, so you can see these different numbers show different levels of expression in each of the genes in each of the cells. And just to give you an idea of some of the numbers, um, there are less than 30,000 um, genes in, the, in humans, so the number of columns is, is less than 30,000 there. Whereas the number of cells, uh, as I said earlier, the technology has allowed us to sequence, say, a million cells in one experiment, so this could have a million rows or, or more, uh, or you might even combine data sets so you've got even more than a million. So the basic idea is that we've transformed all of that kind of messy biology into this um, messy matrix, or maybe it's not messy, it's less messy at least. Um, one of the things about genes is that they're turning on and off, but mainly they're off. Um, so the, they're actually, this is a sparse data set. Um, the blue shows that um, there's, a, there's a value in that um, cell. So I've kind of zoomed out a bit. This isn't the whole thing either because it would be, um, it would be uh, tall and thin. Uh, so it would go down a long way. I haven't put all of that onto the screen. But the idea is that a blue dot shows that there's some gene being expressed there. And you can see blue lines going down. So over here, this one, you can see that there's a big dark blue line which suggests that in every cell that gene was being expressed. So that presumably is some kind of important gene that's always on or we don't, who knows. Whereas if you look, you know, maybe here, there's a white, vertical white, bar where there's no gene expression at all. So that gene is, is off all the time. Um, and then there are more kind of mixed things where sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. Uh, and that's quite interesting because it's, they're similar cells because they're obviously from the same part of the body. Um, but sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. There's probably some interesting biology there that um, we'd like to explore. <coughs> Um, 
how are these things represented in, in memory and on in storage systems? Just very briefly, this is um, a, a library called uh, Sci-Fi Sparse, which is representing a, a, a sparse matrix in memory. And if you if you kind of do the computation, these are these are floats, and we've got however many billion um, elements are stored. It turns out this this thing is represented in um, 10 gigabytes of, of memory. So, you know, manageable. And then, how do you store this thing persistently? Well, there are there are several technologies, but I just wanted to point out one that's um, being used more now. It's called ZAR. It's a relatively new format. And it's basically multi-dimensional chunk storage for um, arrays of data like, like this. And the nice thing about it is that each uh, chunk is, is stored in a separate file, which means that you can, you can store it on a cloud store like um, S3 or Google um, Cloud Storage. And it means you can write in parallel. And that's in contrast to other um, storage formats for, for um, n-dimensional uh, array data, which you may have heard of. HDF5 is probably the, um, the, the most well-known and most used. But that has limitations in terms of doing parallel writes. Um, and ZAR is, is used by the Human Cell Atlas, as is HDF5. They supply both. But it's an, it's a, an interesting um, new format for this kind of data, which is um, I wanted to mention. OK, so let's move on to some of the algorithms. Um, we want to kind of understand the data a bit more than just the sparse representation. So at a very high level, um, we, we have this, this kind of pipeline. So on the left, we have the, the data that I just talked about. It's got 30,000 columns and a million rows. And we really want to kind of compress that down over to here. So we've got two dimensions. And if we've got two dimensions, we can visualize it and get some understanding of what, what it means. Um, but to get there, we do go through a couple of steps. We do some pre-processing, which means that we um, we basically do some normalization. We reduce the uh, um, the number of genes to a thousand because we only look at the the most expressed genes because those are probably the interesting ones. So we take that to a thousand, and then we do some standard PCA, which you've probably heard of, which is principal component analysis, which is basically a dimensionality reduction algorithm to look at where the interesting signal is. And then we do this algorithm called UMAP, which I'm just about to talk about, which allows us to do a visualization of the data. OK, quick quiz, what's that? Anyone guess what, what that is? Sorry? Protein? Protein? No, bigger than that. <laughs> Sorry? Insect? Insect is getting closer. Get, think even bigger. <laughs> what's this thing here? <laughs> Sorry? Snail, no, even bigger, like a really big animal. <laughs> Dinosaurs getting closer. It's a mammoth. <laughs> okay, so, so the reason to show you this is this is a 3D, obviously this is a 3D data set. You know, 3D, um, uh, I'm just going to show them side by side here. So this is a 3D representation of a mammoth, um, and this is kind of putting, projecting it into 2D using this algorithm called UMAP. And the reason, why would you want to do that? Well, this is interesting because it allows you to see what the UMAP algorithm is doing on some data that we understand. So we all know what 3D is and what a mammoth is. So when you, when you run this algorithm, it does this kind of slightly distorting thing. But you can see that the spine in blue over there is uh, maps to the spine there. And then the head is in red. And then you've got the tusks in this kind of ochre color. So you can see it's if you squint, you can see it's kind of stretched into that shape. Um, so the idea, the kind of intuition here is that if you do the same thing in 50 dimensions, then it's going to do something, hopefully, that um, has a similar, similar kind of properties. Um, you may have heard of a, an algorithm called T-SNE, uh, which is similarly uh, a similar kind of idea where you, you take a large number of dimensions and squash them down into 2D so you can visualize it. And they both have uh, uh, acronyms that I'm not going to read out. Um, and they both capture local structure well, which means that if two points in the original space are close together, they will be close together in the low-dimensional space. 
Um, but UMAP is generally thought of as better because it kind of c captures a global structure better, which we saw with the kind of uh, the spine and then the head and then the tusks had some kind of global relationship that TSNE might not capture. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about how it works or anything, but there's a very, if you're interested in the kind of mathematical ideas, there's a very readable um, explanation of it um, on, on the web on, in its documentation. Okay, so if we apply that to um, the single cell data, when we start to see things like this, um, so we've got different colors which show, I'll talk about those in a minute, but the idea is that you, you get a representation and you can start trying to understand the biology here. This is a, a smaller data set, but the idea here is that the different clusters have been labeled with, <coughs> with cell types. And this is the kind of thing that helped the, the, um, the researchers in Edinburgh to identify a new cell type. I mean, this isn't the data set, but it's the same idea where they probably saw um, a new cluster and said, what's that, and then investigated it further. So these tools allow you to see things in, in very large dimensions um, and, and explore the data like that. Um, I'm probably not going to talk very much about this, but basically nearest neighbors is, is needed as a prerequisite for all of this. And the idea behind nearest neighbors is in a, in a uh, large dimensional space, you try and find which points are closest to each other. Um, over here, we've just found the, the nearest point and connected them if, they're, um, if it's the nearest one. And the idea is in, in the cell context is that points that are closer in space are related in some way. So cells that are close to each other have similar gene expression profiles, so they probably have similar bi biology and similar things are happening to them. Um, and it's the most basic kind of algorithm out there, nearest neighbors. In machine learning terms, it's one of the, the, the simplest ones um, to understand, at least. But interestingly, there are lots of different algorithms, um, and it's still a, um, an area of research. So there are still new algorithms coming out that allow you to do nearest neighbors um, in more efficient ways or with parallelism. So. I won't talk about that in more detail, but it's, it's kind of interesting to me that such a basic algorithm has um, is still an active area of research. Okay, um, so I, t I talked a little bit about the clusters. There were different colors, um, and this is an algorithm um, which allows you to uh, find clusters in large, um, high-dimensional data sets, which is called Lubain community detection, but I don't think, I probably haven't got time to, to go into um, how it works, but it's, uh, um, it's, it's the algorithm that assigns these clusters. And yeah, so this, the summary of what, what we've done to the, the data that was uh, this sparse matrix, what we did is first of all found the nearest neighbors for each cell. So each cell we find the 30 closest neighbors. And then we use the Louvain algorithm to assign clusters to them. So there are different colors. And you can see that it, it's picking out this one is different to this one. Um, so there's presumably some kind of biological meaning to that, which is what researchers go and um, uh, look at in more detail after they've produced something like this, because it's suggestive at least. And UMAP is the algorithm used to plot this um, in 2D so that we can uh, we can understand it a bit more. I've talked quite generally or in abstract terms about the data and the algorithms. Um, I'm going to make it a little bit more concrete by talking about the compute. Um, so the, what we really want is to be able to express these algorithms in high-level um, languages, high-level terms, and yet have them run very efficiently on, on modern hardware. Um, that's our ideal. And in fact, the kind of Python, the scientific Python um, ecosystem has, has been doing that for a long time now. Um, the PyData ecosystem, as it's called, has many projects in it. I've just mentioned three here. Um, probably the best well-known one is called NumPy. And that allows you to represent multidimensional arrays. Um, 
and, and do processing on them very efficiently. It compiles down to native code, but you express the computation in, in Python. So that's, that's great. Pandas has data frames. So if you have used R, you'll have heard of data frame. Pandas is the <coughs> Python equivalent. And then scikit-learn is the kind of standard set of machine learning libraries for, for um, Python. And there are many more projects like that. But what we find when we're operating on very large data sets is that we want, um, uh, we, we want to operate on with multiple CPUs on, on clusters as well, potentially. Um, so there's a new project, well, not, it's not new, sorry, it's been around for a while, called Dask, which um, generalizes the um, PyData APIs to run um, on multiple CPUs. And what it does is it kind of chunks up um, very large data sets into little into chunks, and those chunks are represented as NumPy arrays, and Dask kind of coordinates the computations over these collections of, um, <coughs> of arrays. And you can run it on a laptop, or you can run it on a 1,000 node cluster, and it, it takes care of things for you. And it fits well with the storage system ZAR that I mentioned earlier. And in some ways, this is very similar to Apache Spark, which is probably better known, certainly in a kind of business context. Um, and I'd say that's quite a good, uh, you know, which one would you use? I think Spark is generally used more in, in kind of business problems. It has SQL, um, whereas Dask doesn't have any kind of SQL integration, um, but it works really well on these kind of array data structures that I've been talking about. Um, and they both have similar scaling characteristics. You can scale them up to thousands of, of cores. Um, and you can run them on very small problems as well. And Dask is, is very fast at that, actually. You can start it. It's basically a starting uh, sub-second startup time because um, it's just starting a thread, whereas Spark is a bit more overhead. And they've got very similar logos, I notice. Um, So that's the scaling I'm talking about here. So scaling out, how do you get more machines to, to solve your problem? PyData traditionally has, has focused on sing, single CPU um, computations. Dask allows you to extend that by throwing more CPUs at it, either in the same machine or um, in a cluster of machines, and that's called scale out. The other way of scaling is called, <coughs> is to get is to get faster machines, um, you know, or bigger machines. And you can think of a GPU as being like a faster <coughs> CPU in certain, uh, for certain contexts, certain problems. Um, and, and there's another library <laughs> called Rapids, which is, that, that is quite new. And that basically re-implements all of the PyData APIs, but for c a, CP, uh, a GPU, sorry, back end. Um, And then the nice thing is you can combine the two. You can scale out, so you can have multiple G GPUs and scale up yeah, using multiple GPUs by combining those two libraries. They're kind of designed to work well together, Dask and Rapids. Dask give you, gives you the kind of uh, scale out parallelism, and D Rapids gives you the GPU capability. And just to go through some, some numbers on that, um, this is a, an experiment that Matthew Rocklin, who's the, the kind of guy behind um, Dask, um, did. He, he took two terabytes of random data and he just added up all those numbers, which is quite an artificial thing, but it's, it gives you an idea of what you can do. So if you look at the bottom left in Dask, um, single-threaded, um, one CPU core took two hours, 39 minutes to do that computation. If you run it on 40 cores, you get it in 11 minutes, 30 seconds. So a massive increase already. But then if you run it on one GPU, you get it in one minute and 37 seconds, which is very fast, <laughs> even faster. And then if you combine the two, then you get this amazing speed up again of uh, 19 seconds running on eight GPUs on a single machine. That's quite an artificial benchmark because it's random data. There's no kind of data movement going on. Um, but I did a similar um, uh, comparison using um, using some you know real computation. One of these single cell analysis things, where we are computing nearest neighbors, Louvain and, and UMAP, and the numbers aren't quite as good. 
Um, but you can see there's still a massive speed up running on, on GPUs. Um, so definitely worth, um, you know, in, in the, for this algor these algorithms, it's definitely worth running on, on, on a GPU. Okay, so here's my parting question. Do we still need clusters? Um, brave thing for someone working on Hadoop to say. Um, I just looked up some of the machines that are available on Google Cloud. Um, the top one, M2 Ultramem 416, gives you 416 virtual CPUs and 11.7 uh, terabytes of memory, which is a huge amount of compute. Um, and just a rough calculation, I haven't, you know, done this, uh, run, run on this, this thing, but it should scale up to um, 100 million cells. So I was talking about data sets of a few million cells, which is where we are today, but obviously that's going to grow. But this machine could um, theoretically process that amount of data. Um, and that doesn't have any GPUs in it. There's also a machine um, that has eight GPUs, but you know, about 100 CPUs, um, and that would, would be uh, a very powerful machine for doing this kind of computation as well. So I think, to, to kind of answer my own question a little bit, um, yes, but I think um, these kind of, this kind of infrastructure that we, we can get um, today in the cloud very quickly and cheaply is certainly powerful enough to begin a lot of these experiments. And I think um, exhausting those capabilities before moving to a cluster is the kind of sensible thing to do. Um, however, it does require, and all of this requires, that our algorithms can run um, using parallel, um, multiple CPUs in parallel. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a really great talk. Thank and I, I shouted out dinosaur. And you Very showed that close. picture. Yeah, and I yeah, was yeah. like, that's a dinosaur. And I thought, no way. Both extinct. Yeah. 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 Pretty cool. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to put my notes down. So folks, we have a nice slot of time now for questions. Um, so some of you might have been in this room already, and you might have heard me say this already. But I'm going to say it again, because it's kind of important. When we do a Q&A session, we are looking for questions from the audience. We would love to avoid the kind of back and forth conversation, um, the debate, um, or comments. If you have that kind of uh, stuff you want to put forward, come and talk to Tom over the lunch break <coughs> or this afternoon. He obviously loves this stuff and would be more than happy <laughs> to talk to you about it. But right here, right now, what we're keen on is questions. So the lovely Lizzie here has a roving microphone, so we can bring a microphone to you. Um, so please wait to have the microphone before you ask your question, because we all want to hear what your question is. So do we have any questions? Right, lovely. Right at the back there, Lizzie's on her way to you. And the other thing we've realized today is just hang on to the microphone until Tom has finished answering your question, because he might have a question for you. <laughs> So, and then we don't want to have to make Lizzie run around all the time. So Thanks, Tom. Uh, that was great uh, talk. Uh, one quick question. Do you know if this uh, Rapids uh, library framework, does it work on anything else than NVIDIA? Because I've seen you had NVIDIA uh, example there. Um, that's a good question. Does it work on anything except NVIDIA? It's ATI. It's, yeah, it's developed by NVIDIA. So ah, I, think right. <laughs> right. I think it probably doesn't. I haven't checked that. Um, right. Thanks. Yeah. Great question. Great answer, too. Right. <laughs> Have we any more? Don't be shy. We're very friendly here. OK, Lizzie, sorry. Back down the front, darling. <laughs> hey, uh, you're, thanks for the great talk. Um, you're clustering based on gene expression. I know nothing about biology. Um, does that mean that cells are either one type or the other? Because um, the clusters were very defined. Um, and what determines gene expression? Is it the cells they're close to? Because in the, I don't know, yeah. Um, when you say the cells they're close to, you, do you physically, mean physically close to, physically. as opposed to gene expression. I, so you're clustering. I, you had two types of clustering, right? The yeah. first 3D to 2D was kind of clustering on position, right? 
Uh, sorry, so, you're yes, doing the yes, that's a good point, actually, point. Yeah. In the mammoth example, you're right, the, the colours, the clusters were to do with um, physical position of body part, basically, because that was a way of... Sh so you could, you could map between them with your eye, basically, so you could see that you know, the spine is over here on this one and over here on this one. But, yeah, that's a really good point and maybe slightly misleading because in the cell work... Uh, the clusters are not defined by physical position at all. It's all to do with gene expression, as you said. Um, right, and so, sorry, was there another part to the question? Uh, there? Yeah, so what causes the gene to be expressed? Is it the cell as it's close to? So I don't really know if, if, it, if that's what it is. Um, but uh, I don't think it's always as clear cut as that either. I think the thing about gene expression is that it varies over time. So a uh, a cell might be in a particular state doing something and then change to another state and there might be multiple states so it's when you catch it so um, the human cell atlas is doing more than what I showed as well it's not uh, it's not just about gene expression it is about position and there's a 3D thing as well which I haven't talked about at all but but that's um, so there, there is more kind of uh, measurements that are being done for, for the human cell atlas to determine different types of, of uh, uh, characteristics of cells, and this was just one of them, really. Thank you so much. I'm going to read about okay. cells. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting stuff, isn't it? Okay, we have oh, we have two. So we'll go for the gentleman in the sort of bluey green shirt first, uh, and then. Uh -oh. <laughs> Tom, it's good to see you when we're not in a pub. Um, <laughs> how did you actually try renting any of those effectively Google supercomputers for your code? Um, so the ones that I mentioned, I have not. I, I didn't even look at the price, actually, <laughs> um, which I probably should have done and put a big thing. But I, I imagine they're fairly cheap because you might not use them for very long. That's the general thing I found. But in all of the work that I've been doing, I, what I've been doing is renting, I use Google Cloud, renting a single machine on Google Cloud with lots of CPUs to run this stuff. I haven't run it on, you know, whatever it was, 416 CPUs. But I regularly run on, I think it's, at least 96, or there's another one that's a bit, bit larger. And, and that works really well. Um, you don't have to worry about fault tolerance in the same way. And in Hadoop clusters, there's you know, machines coming and going and failing and, and whatever. Whereas if you've got one machine, um, it's just going to fail totally or it's going to be fine. So there are certainly some simplifying things to working in, in, in this way. Awesome. Now, we had another question just behind you. Yeah, perfect. Um, we'll take your question, and then I think I saw another hand go up over there, and then we will break for lunch. So please go ahead. Hi, Tom. The um, Human Cell Atlas Project. Um, I just noticed the number of cell contributions, like 160 lung tissue mm. samples, it seems really low. Do you know how they <laughs> go about getting donors to this project? and why those numbers look really low? Um, I, I don't know very much about that side of it, to be honest. I haven't been working directly on the human cell atlas itself, but I suspect there are it, it's to do with permissions issues and, and all of that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, but And I didn't really show more about, I didn't have time to talk about human cell atlas, but it has this amazing kind of infrastructure um, which is all cloud-based and, you know, you can go and run run analyses on there, you can download the data, and you, you, it's, it's quite a, a good platform actually, they've, they've done some really good, um, used a lot of appropriate technologies to, to manage this data and kind of provide it to people, and you can, you can go and look at stuff on, through browsers as well to kind of drill into to data, but it, you know, you have to be a scientist basically, it's not something that um, I could go and kind of do something meaningful on. But from a kind of infrastructure point of view, it's quite an impressive thing. Okay, so a little audience participation here. If we can pass the mic microwave, oh my goodness, <laughs> microphone this way. And this will be our final You're question. Of lunch. I am thinking of lunch. You're right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, so you've hinted a little bit, and even right there, at the mm. challenges of, I guess, understanding the biology. Mm. Do you have any reflections or advice for tech specialists? wanting to age and work on a project with such a specialist area? Yeah, that's a really good question because I 
<coughs> obviously, I, I don't have any biology training, and um, I spent a lot of time working on on big data systems. But I found so j yeah, just talking what I mentioned about the human cell atlas infrastructure, there is a huge demand for people who know this stuff, you know, the infrastructure stuff, and it, the, um, lots of biology has been built by, you know, biological tools has been built by scientists in the past, which, you know, we need more people from industry to, to, to participate in that. Um, a lot of it is open source as well, so actually there's a pathway there to get into um, working on these things. Um, human cell atlas, but there are lots of other projects that I think I mentioned in my first slide about me. GATK is a, a big kind of genome analysis toolkit that I've worked on. Open source, again. Um, ScanPy, which is, drives a lot of the, the, the stuff I've been talking about. Again, open source. Um, the, the trick is how do you kind of, you, you need to be able to work with the, the science team that, that's doing the work as well. Just being a kind of lone contributor doesn't really help unless you're talking to the scientists. So the hard bit is finding how you can work with a group of scientists, either by joining like a, a lab or something, which is kind of what I did, or a bigger institute like uh, Sanger Center in Cambridge would be a good example of that. I guess there's, there's stuff in Bristol that I don't know about as well, in the, at the university. <coughs> or, yeah. So there are, yeah, there are, I could probably talk to you a bit more offline if you're interested in uh, finding routes into this stuff. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. So we're just going to pass that microphone back to Lizzie. Right, well, thank you, folks. A great set of questions, and I'm sure, like, Everyone in this room, I was delighted that they were all questions, so mm -hmm. thank you ever so much for obliging us. Um, let's give Tom a huge round of applause. Thank you. All right then, so it's lunchtime. Hooray! Okay, um, but before you go, did anyone find the duck? There is a rubber duck. Yes, someone has found the duck. Would you like a T-shirt? All right, sweet. Do you want to introduce yourself, or is that taking it a step too far? All right, Lizzie, would you mind taking the microphone up the back there? <laughs> We're just a little bit of audience participation before lunch. Hi, you've won a T-shirt. Well Hello. done. Hi. Uh, what's your name? My name's Ben. Ben. Yes. Hi, Ben. Uh, what are you working on, Ben? What do you do? Uh, so I'm a trainee software developer at the UK Hydrographic Office. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. And what have you been learning today? I'm sure you've just learned stuff about cells. Yeah, Anything absolutely. you want to share? Um, no, I mean, I was taking notes the whole time, so um, I just need to digest those. But um, no, I've been doing, you know, I went to security earlier and um, LSP, so yeah, learning a lot. Awesome, like all of us. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, you can go and claim your t shirt from the reception desk. Okay, great. Thank um, you. But I'd like the duck back. Yeah, okay, I'll bring right. it to yeah, you. Sweet. <laughs> okay, so um, let's just round off one quick Icelandic thunderclap. I don't think I have to explain this anymore. Three, two, one. Go, lunch, let's go, see you later. <laughs>